Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to more 30k lore. We are still on book 12, A Thousand Suns, with this being part three. Granted, I always knew that A Thousand Suns would be a pretty massive breakdown video, but uh, oh, I'm hoping we'll be done in part three. Though, even now, I'm not entirely certain, because they're... Oh boy, if you thought the previous two parts had interesting and important things in them, this part... Ooh, the trial of Magnus, the invasion of Prospero, yeah, this could take a while. So, without any further ado, let's get started. Firstly, let's touch upon the whole Horus becoming Warmaster thing. So, of course, during the uh, previous celebrations, Horus was granted the title of Warmaster. Many of his brothers were not entirely happy with this, and a lot of them had very, very different reactions to it. Some reacted with jealousy, some reacted with anger, some reacted with a sense of pride, even. Magnus, he hides his reaction fairly well. Araman asked him straight out if... Perhaps Magnus might in some way be jealous about this, jealous about Horus' bond to the Emperor, and Magnus refuses this, stating that he held conversations with the Emperor before Magnus was even Magnus. Essentially, his spirit, quote-unquote, was already conversing with the Emperor before his physical body had even fully taken form, which is... interesting, certainly. And due to this very unique bond, he was not in any way jealous of Horus being the first Primarch to be discovered, because as far as Magnus was concerned, he'd never been lost. Nevertheless, I do believe that this did rankle him a bit. Not necessarily all that much, but his hesitant in answering the question and kind of deflecting a little bit, I do think that he was probably a little bit hurt, and then again, when he tells the Emperor that he's discovered the webway, and Daddy E basically just goes, yep, already knew about that. Oh, and by the way, don't look into it anymore, sonny boy, I've got it from here. Yeah, it definitely did bruise his pride a bit. Back to Araman, though, and his little pet psyker, Lemuel. He's been trying to teach him how to read the future, with limited success. He's kind of given up on that and is thinking maybe you should ship Lemuel off to the more um, esoterical parts of the Brotherhood to try and teach him how to read auras better, for example, which is of course already the skill that Lemuel has, kind of? It's a little bit interesting how the Thousand Sons even view this. They view Lemuel's powers as a... how do I put it? An, an accident, almost? They basically view his kind of psyche as a blind child stumbling in the dark, rather than any kind of, you know, oh, god, that's amazing, you can see what people think by looking at them, that's odd. They really have brought this down to a certain scientific level, where this shit is fully codified by them and they just don't find it particularly interesting at all anymore. And obviously, as we all know, familiarity breeds contempt, but again, this is really one of those just arrogances of the Thousand Suns, isn't it? They, well, this thing, they do know that the warp is dangerous, they don't know how dangerous, and they view this, which is contact with the warp, as a curiosity. I mean, Lemuel is technically a walking nuclear bomb. Now, his flare in the warp is so small that he's very, very unlikely to ever get possessed by anything, but still, the fact that they view even low-level psychers like this as a curiosity rather than a, oh my god, lock it up, <laughs> or, you know, to be a charitable, teach it how to control itself, kind of surprising. Especially considering the tale he then tells to Lemuel about the Thousand Suns' home planet of Prospero. And here is some interesting things. So, Prospero, an ancient human civilization and everything, was practically wiped off the map by a certain psychic predator known as a Psyche Nguyen. These were giant monstrosities that, well, Imagine the rape child of a horsefly and a Japanese giant hornet, then buff it up to roughly the size of a pit bull, and give it the ability to kill people with its mind, and you've got a pretty good image of what a Psychnoin is. 
And it was that last kill people with their mind thing that was particularly unfortunate about these little critters. Apparently they could, through the power of magic, teleport their eggs, which were the size of a grain of sand, which is interesting enough in and of itself, into the host body's brain where they would hatch and begin eating the host's brain. And after having om nom nom the soft pink tissue, they would go to the size where they would be able to eat the rest of the host body. And after about 48 hours or so, they would be done with that and spread across the nearby area. And considering that hundreds, if not thousands, of the little fuckers could hatch at once, and that they, of course, then would look for other hosts, well, it doesn't require a whole lot of imagination to realize just how badly this is going to go for the local population. Interestingly enough though, there are a couple other creatures in 40k that actually does utilize the warp in some faction. Like for example a bunch of teleporting lizards that literally travel through the warp from planet to planet through... Again, the power of magic, I'm assuming. These psychic predators, well, you know, the psychic part is not impossible. There are other psychic predators in 40k. If anything, it's their reproductive cycle that seems absolutely insane. For something that starts out as an egg the size of a grain of sand to turn into something the size of a pit bull in 48 hours... <laughs> I'm not a biologist, but that sounds fucking unlikely to me. Additionally, I'm not sure how much meat they could really draw from, you know, one body, considering the sheer number of Psychnoines we're talking about. All of this leads me to think that the Psychnoines probably weren't simple animals, especially considering they'd been living alongside the human population for god only knows how long, and yet suddenly now, their population explodes and pushes the human population on Prospero to virtual extinction. This all sounds rather planned out to me. And considering later events, well, I'm thinking these things are probably if not full-on demons, very, very, very close to it. Especially considering the tale that Magnus is about to spin to Lemuel. So how precisely does a mere membrance get a audience with the Primarch, not to mention a chat with him about his founding myth? Well, Armin Lemuel was having a nice little chat over some wine. Oh, and by the way, Wine grown by Ahriman. He brings up the point that once the galaxy is won, what need will the galaxy have of super soldiers? And so Ahriman decided to pick up winemaking. Doesn't really fit in with the superhuman killing machine image, but hey, he probably enjoys it, I guess. The interesting part is, of course, that somebody within the Legion has actually thought about it. Most Legions haven't really thought about these questions, even at this fairly late stage. Gilliman, of course, and his Ultramarines have always been planning for the inevitable victory because, well, he's Gilliman. Planning is kinda what he does. Dorne kinda has the future of his legion set out for him by the Emperor, being his Praetorians, and a couple other legions also have their roles to play, but as we saw with the Lunar Wolves, most of them hadn't really considered this question. They pretty much just assumed that there were always going to be some kind of a war to fight. Anyways, get back to the point. They were having a little discussion when Magnus showed up and decided to tell Lemuel all about his arrival on Prospero and how he came to be what he had become and why Prospero was the world it was today. It's quite interesting that Magnus would choose to reveal all of this to a Remembrancer. It probably was a way of rewarding him, honestly. The Thousand Suns don't do anything spontaneously, and this most definitively was not just something Magnus decided to do, because why the fuck not? It's quite fortunate for us the reader, however, since there are some pretty juicy little tidbits of information in this tale. One tiny little side note though before we get to that. So we have had several mentions of how the Emperor appears to be bigger than he really is, like he appears to be a titan, a golden figure, etc. This is the second time that we hear mention from a mortal that Magnus appears to be something different than what he really is. Lemuel points out that Magnus appears to be larger than he really is. The specific word is he shakes off the impression of a hazy outline of a larger Magnus. 
I'm wondering if maybe, just maybe, Magnus is employing something kind of like the same trick that the Emperor is employing. The thing is, he's never really, he doesn't really mention this, and I don't think he would feel the need to try and impress Lemuel. Additionally, this was also mentioned back when Lemuel and his lady friends were spying on Magnus during the gathering. He wouldn't even be able to have been aware of them at the time, and certainly wouldn't have been directing any kind of psychic tricks in their direction. I'm wondering if perhaps this is how... how do I put it? How mortals view creatures of great psychic potential. That would kind of explain why it would seem that everybody views the Emperor kind of like he's larger than life. Then again, the theory kind of falls apart as well, because that would imply that Magnus was doing this unconsciously, whereas the Emperor, he does this fully consciously, as we saw in The Last Church, for example. The Emperor chose to not reveal himself as the golden being he was, and still pretended to be a normal, albeit very large, human. I'm honestly not entirely sure what to make of this. I'm kind of 50-50 that Magnus is just putting this on as an act and he's doing this all the time because, well, it must absorb the tiniest, most infantile speck of his power to do this, so maybe he doesn't care. Maybe he just does it because why not? After all, for a being of his power, putting on a mirage of greater majesty would be like... Ugh. Well, it's like combing your hair. It's something that requires the absolute minimum amount of effort. Mm, it certainly is an interesting little aside to take note of, but anyways, let's return to Magnus's story. So, when Magnus arrived on Prospero, they considered it to be a uh, rather groundbreaking event, to nobody's surprise. The population was of course made up primarily of psychers, but not particularly skilled ones. They had enough skill to ward their minds against the Psyche Nuin, which ravaged the rest of the planet, which was also the only reason why they remained alive. But they had no particularly great talent, and within a year or so of arrival, Magnus had pretty much become better than all of them, which must have been rather, I don't know, infuriating? Surprising? I mean, here comes this child falling from the stars, and within a year he's correcting the wisest men in Prospero. Huh. It's gotta be an interesting feeling. Anyways, this last city was kept alive by their psychic wards. If anyone were to go outside of them and attract the attention of the Psyche Nuin, well, they die really, really quickly. More, well, the exact opposite. They would die very, very slowly and in a great deal of pain, which is even worse. However, they had clearly managed to build a sustainable society, as Magnus mentioned that within the walls he suffered no deprivations, no hunger, no thirst, etc. Which is why he decided to wander outside and play with the giant monster flies. Because he wanted to test himself. Which kinda sounds like testing if you're fireproof by sticking your head in a fireplace to me, but hey, it's Magnus. He would undoubtedly argue, and indeed he kinda did, that how would you know that you're truly fireproof if you didn't do that? And of course, bearing in mind that Magnus was always entirely and completely convinced that wasn't actually dangerous, he was Magnus. In his own words, he was doing this to see if he even had limits at all. He spent some 40 days wandering across the place without getting skullfucked to death, so... Clearly, he had more than enough power to keep the monster flies away, if nothing else, until eventually he happened across the ruins of a large city, inside of which he found a statue made out of multicultured glass, so that it looked like it was ever-changing in a colour and hue, toppling slowly back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, right next to a massive drop-off. The statue was described as having the long, elegant neck of a swan. Hmm, sounds familiar. Where have I uh, I've heard about something like that? An eagle, you say? Hmm, with ever-changing colours. Gee, I wonder what that could represent. And as soon as Magnus showed up, it decided to fall. Magnus, thinking that, well, this was unusual, decided to head down the cliff and check out all of the thousands upon thousands of shards. Now... The shards turned out to be rather unusual because 
they formed perfect geometric patterns, all kinds of them. There was a perfect circle there, a perfect rhombus here, an exact square there, and Magnus spent literally days just wandering across this broken carpet of glass, finding more and more intricate geometrical shapes, which obviously was somewhat odd. Granted, if you have tens of thousands of shards, odds are some of them will form up, but this was far too often, and the longer he looked, the more shapes he found, the more complex shapes he found. Until eventually he figured it was all one massive shape. He figured all kinds of secrets were hidden within the information, quote unquote, in this shattered glass. Now, this is rather interesting. So, a statue of something that looks disturbingly much like a uh, Zinch Greater Demon, made of multicolored uh, glass that decides to topple over just when Magnus arrives and then shatter into tens of thousands of pieces, forming precise geometric shapes. Ha! Huh. This all sounds rather suspicious, hell. I wouldn't be entirely surprised if whoever built this did so without having any idea what he was making, and this statue might not be quite so innocent. So I mentioned previously that the cyclamines probably are not entirely normal. It just so happens that this statue appears to have been finished round about the time that the cyclamines started skull-fucking the population to death. Coincidence? Well, as Magnus himself says, there is no such thing as coincidence. Magnus spent even longer looking at all of the shapes and finding ever new ones and noting them down in his little diary. Until eventually, Amon, now a captain of the Thousand Sons, arrived and asked Magnus what the hell he was doing, squatting in a field of broken glass. When Magnus first showed him the field, he simply laughed and said, Oh, this is silly, there's nothing here, it's just broken glass. When Magnus showed him his grimoire, however, he immediately noticed the patterns himself and became overcome with the majesty of it all. Eventually, the two of them travelled back to Prospero and brought oh, the whole damn council of the city out to have a look at it, with all of them being equally impressed. And they would focus on different things. Some would focus on the squares, some the circles, some the shapes overall, some the colours, etc. They all agreed that this was something unusual, magical, that could only have been created by a higher intelligence. A primordial creator. Interesting this, isn't it? It would appear as if Magnus' entire theory about the primordial creator is based off something so simple as a savage looking up at the sun and deciding the only way that can function is if a chariot is pulling it across the sky. In other words, Magnus came across something he couldn't explain, and so, as humanity has done throughout history, decided to attribute it to a greater power. And to be fair, in this particular case, he probably wasn't wrong. Which again strengthens my theory that this statue was rather heretical from the word go, and probably at least partially responsible for the desolation of Prospero. However, there was one little teensy weensy problem. Now that all of the scholars had won doubt and looked at all of the shiny colours, they had all received such massive intellectual bonus that they'd forget to protect themselves against the monster flies, who now arrived in their millions to feast upon soft, squishy, intellectual flesh. And at this point, Ahriman hadn't really developed any real combat powers yet, remember? He'd only really been taught by the Masters of Prospero, and he'd had some conversations with the Emperor on how to harness his power, but nothing really combat related. And yet... He now started functioning like a goddamn flamethrower, delivering all kinds of horrible poontang upon the poor little monster flies, who suddenly realised that they were attacking a bunch of cheaters that could throw fire up into the air and view the future and shit like that. Apparently, all of this rose up from within Magnus based upon some hidden power, some locked away potential. Interestingly enough, however, the people with him also gained certain powers. For example, the ones that had seen the pattern in the red stones became the Piraea, and Amon, whose mastery of the mysteries of the glass was second only to Magnus, became able to see the future, the Corvidae. This was how the cults of the Thousand Sons were formed. 
This is rather interesting, isn't it? If we are going to go by the assumption that this rather clearly Zinchian inspired statue was in fact Zinchian, then that would mean that the shards were also inspired by the primordial creator, in this case good old Birdbrain himself. Which means that all of the Thousand Suns' powers, their entire fundamental basis for learning, etc., was all based upon Zinch from the very get-go. This would then mean that there really was no saving the Thousand Suns. Whatever happened, they would be wiped out or turn traitor. Either the flesh change would destroy them, or they would be corrupted by the teaching of Magnus and his acolytes. The moment he saw that statue topple, hell, the moment he arrived on Prospero, the fate of the Thousand Suns was practically sealed. Even then, though, it's important to point out just how fragile this plan actually was. It contained a number of stepping stones in which, at any point, if the plan failed, everything would fall apart. If they didn't start utilizing their powers more after a Goru, for example, then the Great Conclave, which Magnus just received news of, wouldn't have happened. At the same time, if they hadn't gotten into trouble with the Space Wolves, then again, the Conclave would never have happened. If Magnus hadn't seen the various patterns in the Eagle, it wouldn't have happened. Zinch really does love his complicated Keikakudori plans, and this... this is one hell of a complicated plan. We have now, however, reached uh, the crucial breaking point, the Council of Nikea has been called, the council where the Emperor will finally decide upon the usage of psychic powers in combat for the Legione Sestatis. Magnus is, to begin with, overjoyed. This clearly, then, is a chance for him to prove to everybody that his Legion was in the right all along, and to really present their case to their brother Legionaries. Whether or not that will work out, well, we'll have to wait and see. Now, Nikea itself as a planet was um, an interesting pick for such a meeting. It was a very young planet undergoing some um, minor temper tantrums. You know, massive volcanic cataclysms, entire continents are ramming against each other, being split open and torn apart, planet-wide earthquakes that level mountains and pretty much never stop, and of course, constant storms. It was an interesting place to have a meeting, um, some might see a certain poetic message in this, and, well, Magnus kinda does. Apparently he figured that this was a good sign that the Emperor showed him this because it would speak to him, the doing and undoing of a planet would somehow be a good thing, apparently. It didn't occur to Magnus, however, that if one were to have a conclave that one would then want to never be talked about again because of the rather sensitive matters discussed. Well, having said Conclave on a planet that was constantly exploding would be a fairly natural choice. Meanwhile, as always, being far more reasonable than his liege lord, Ahriman was shitting his britches, as apparently he'd seen this before. In fact, this was a part of the uh, dreams he'd had back on Ogoro, when he had that little tussle with the warp demons and got saved by Ortho Weirdmake. He knew something off this place, he didn't know precisely what, his vision was too fragmented to really tell, but... He did know that whatever he'd seen probably wasn't good. His worries weren't exactly uh, put to rest when they were met on the landing platform by Sanguinius and Fulgrim, both of which had of course brought their full honor guards. Uh, Ottoman noted that it looked a little bit more like a prisoner escort than an actual honor guard. And, uh, well, he was more or less right, although only about half right. Sanguinius appears to have been relatively in the dark as to what was about to happen next. Fulgrim, on the other hand, he appears to have been read in on the situation at some point. His stance is not entirely clear as of yet, but uh, it quickly becomes clear to even Magnus the Dense that he hasn't been summoned to uh, 
present the merits of his case, so to say. Rather, he is here to defend himself against the accusations of others. And speaking of accusations, I am constantly being accused by YouTube for not putting enough ads in my videos, so here you go. Next April, I'm thinking of uploading a video like this and just putting in an ad every 30 seconds. I'll tell you it's a joke, but uh, you'll never quite believe me, will you? Now, back to the interesting part of Magnus's de facto trial, though before that, one little interesting mention. So, Magnus has himself a personal remembrancer, a fairly famous one as well, who used to do some pretty goddamn good work. Magnus had asked for him specifically to be his, well, biographer, basically. However, Magnus... I'm a bit... This is one of those things, isn't it? So, Magnus has essentially enslaved the guy. He's essentially mind-fucked him to the point where he isn't really recording anything of his free will. He's essentially just jotting down whatever remembrances Magnus puts into his head. In fact, Magnus even says that he jots down stuff using Kalamakas, and then he himself goes through it later and works it into the Great Book of Magnus. He's essentially using this dude as Windows Notepad. The thing is, Magnus doesn't really strike me like the guy who'd just do this to a gifted individual for no particular reason. He values talent, and yet here he takes a supposedly very good autobiographer and basically mindfucks him into being nothing but a servitor with a typewriter. Odd? I suspect Magnus himself isn't entirely aware of what he's doing. He does note that he's essentially, you know, kind of jotting things down using Kalamakis as an instrument, but I don't think he understands just how much of an impact this has had upon Kalamakis' psyche. Though granted that is the, shall we say, generous interpretation, he seems entirely blasé about it, to the point where I actually do think that he isn't aware that he's doing it, and the alternative is, of course, that he simply doesn't give a fuck. Though again, I feel like that would be rather contrary to his personality, as he thinks it is very important to put one's best foot forward when it comes to interacting with the wider Imperium and introducing them to psychic powers. Mind-fucking his own remembrance uh, doesn't seem like the right foot. Anyways, back to... Well, the trial, basically, and indeed it would later be become known as just that, the trial of Magnus the Red. Magnus, at this point, has already realised that he is in for a uh, rather interesting series of events, to put it rather mildly. Interestingly enough, there is also a mention of a conversation between Ahriman and Magnus talking about the Emperor. Ahriman senses that the Emperor is somehow distraught by this, and that he doesn't want to have this trial, which is very interesting, because I don't know of anybody that can really make the Emperor do something the Emperor doesn't want to do. Now, there's a great deal of butting and abouting in the book, talking about how this has been a kind of malignant topic within the Imperium. A lot of uh, controversy has been going around about the idea of the Librarius, which was originally founded by Magnus, Sanguinius, and Jagatai Khan. Now, you might think that the Khan seems like the odd one out here, but not really. The Khan is actually very, very much so pro the idea of these librarians. He sees them as practically warrior poets. We'll get into more about the White Scars in their own uh, book, which will eventually come around, but they're a fascinating lot, really are. Anyways, back to the topic. The librarians proved themselves to be quite efficient, and as such, they were eventually integrated into pretty much all of the other legions. This tells me that it can't possibly have been that tumultuous a subject. I mean, they mentioned that there's been some problems in the past, but it's never really come to head, it's always been smoothed over, and yet apparently it is such a serious topic that it is forcing the Emperor, of all goddamn people, to do something he doesn't want to do. Bearing in mind, once again, this is of course after Horus being crowned Warmaster. 
which means at this point in time the Emperor should be elbow deep in some long lost cavity of the Eldar webway, trying to rip open new and interesting holes and use it for his own purposes, and yet here he is on Nikea of all places, residing over a conclave discussing the question of librarians within the legions, a question that honestly doesn't seem that important. This is one of those um, things where I really think there should have been some more actual backstory here. I mean, the Thousand Sons, just before this, were operating side by side with the Word Bearers and the Space Wolves using their powers very liberally in an almost never before seen sense and they did relatively well. Nobody really reacted to them until that little spat with the library where Magnus decided to not burn it and um, Russ wasn't particularly pleased. Now, granted, Lehman Russ did see a thousand sun turn into a literal goddamn chaos spawn right in front of him and uh, that would be a pretty good motivating factor to go to daddy and bitch all about it, but this all seems to have come to a head really, really suddenly. We will get a little bit more information in an upcoming book about the Space Wolves, but for the moment we left a little bit in the dark. And speaking of Space Wolves, the Thousand Sons first, well let's call him what he is, Accuser, turned out to be Otha Vidmake. Well, 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 it uh, would appear that the whole thing about trying to convince him over to their side was, uh, at best, a waste of time, and at worst, a yeah, rather large mistake. Especially the whole part where Ottoman showed him his pet demon and went like, This is my tutelary. It teaches me things. Oh, and by the way, it's also a warp spawned monstrosity. Turns out Arthur Weirdmake um, hadn't been quite as happy and nonchalant as he had um, pretended to. I partially think that Arthur Weirdmake was to a certain extent convinced, but upon seeing the um, transformation during the little scuffle with the Thousand Tons later on, I think he started seeing everything in a rather more disturbing light. And so now he condemns the Thousand Sons in the strongest possible words. And to add insult to injury, who substantiates and seconds this accusation? Fucking Mortarion, who takes precisely 7 times 4, 28 steps, to the podium. Mortarion, of all people. There is not a single bastard in the entire Imperium that's more steeped in unclean magic than this motherfucker. <laughs> and he knows it too. You can accuse Mortarion of many things, being unrefined, unsubtle, dirty, smelly, certainly, but this is one artfully orchestrated middle finger to Magnus. And whilst he certainly did this, specifically for that very purpose, and indeed it might even be part of his main motivation, he did bring up some good points. For example, him and his Death Guard had fought against actual proper Chaos Worshipping Warlocks before, and um, he had unsurprisingly realised that they were pretty good at fighting, describing Hounds of Corn and Juggernauts attacking his Death Guard and it had taken him and his legion six whole months to subjugate a world armed with nothing but swords and flintlock weapons. The demons, of course, were the non-natural part of the defence, and the reason why it took six whole months. Additionally, Mortarion has a pretty good reason for disliking Chaos Powers, which is, um... Well, we'll get into the complexities of Mortarion's backstory at some point, because it really is a... One hell of a thing, full of confusion, contradictions, and all kinds of really, really odd decisions, but we'll get to that later. Mortarion, of course, came to land on a world where the human population was entirely subjugated, or wait, no. Subjugated isn't really the correct term, because that makes it sound as if they were beaten, taken as slaves, or, you know, just sent out as refugees in the rest of the world. That's not really the correct term. Domesticated is probably a more accurate term in this case. The world had been destroyed after a psychic backlash now was being ruled over, essentially, by a race of half-dead giants that utilised chaos powers. These things were almost certainly worshippers of good old Grandfather Nurgle, 
and Mortadian had even been raised by one of these undead monstrosities until he finally escaped and led a resistance of the few remaining humans against the undead giants. Mortadian had seen more than his fair share of chaos corruption, and was deeply distrustful of sorcery. No particular surprise there. He had also forbid the establishment of Librariuses within his own legion, which uh, would turn out to be one fuck of a mistake, everything considered, but hey, details? I, I really want to get into Mortarion right now, because his backstory is just... It is such a mushroom trip, considering where he ended up, but I'm going to resist. He kept yelling bad words at Magnus for a while, essentially accusing him of sorcery, witchcraft, of running a covent of warlocks, etc, etc, which pissed off Magnus quite badly. Pissed him off to the point where he lowered his psychic barriers and essentially mind-fucked Ahriman into um, unconsciousness. I'm sure that didn't exactly help his fucking case either. Oh hey, Magnus, your equity seemed to have fainted. Any reason why? Oh, t don't mind me. I just overloaded his mind with some of my psychic powers. I'll just, yeah, uh, bring him back to my suite and let him sleep it off. Oh, Magnus. You really are good at digging holes, if nothing else. So, the amount of accusers was um, rather considerable, far beyond what Magnus had originally considered plausible. Apparently, his opponents had done one heck of a job gathering up every single naysayer in the bloody Imperium, as their testimonies went on for literal hours. Apparently there were a lot of people that wished to point a finger at Magnus and call him Warlock. Which, again, all of this seems to be in such contrast to what we heard earlier. The establishment of the Librarian Order was accepted by almost all of the legions, almost all of them had seen them to be valuable, and had accepted them as battle brothers. Hell, even Lehman Russ and his Stormseers, well, they were psychics, for all intents and purposes. Now, I'm pretty sure that Lehman Russ knows they're psychics, whether or not they themselves know, or whether or not they really believe all of that controlling the storm nonsense, as uh, 50-50. But this is a lot of really angry people, and remember, the Imperium is not that intolerant towards psychics. Obviously, they are the boogeymen of the universe. Of course they are. They brought about old night, but psychics are used and trusted within the Imperium to a rather considerable degree. Hell, the Navigator's Guilds are some of the most wealthy organizations in the entire Imperium. And yet, an organization made up of Astartes psychers that have to go through the exact same rigorous mental and physical training as all of the other Astartes, indeed, even more training than regular Astartes, are apparently really, really badly mistrusted. Now, of course, you and me, the reader, we understand the danger of chaos, and we would know where this is going, especially after the rather excellent Legion book, which happened previously in the series, which painted a rather vivid picture of just how bad chaos can get, but within the Imperium, right here, right now, and especially against the Librarian Order in particular, it feels rather sudden. I feel they would have been a lot better if they worked in another book before this, talking about the trials and tribulations of being a librarian in a more direct fashion and showing us some of these problems and some of these uh, issues. Because all we really have is, well, the Dark Angels books, where we do follow a librarian, but him being a librarian has very little bearing on the story. In fact, he ends up saving the day, which you'd think be another good reason to actually let them keep librarians. The whole trial thing just feels a little bit undercooked, but then again, considering how fat this book is, and just how much stuff they have to get through, I can kind of understand why. Now comes the time for Magnus's defense. He gives them all a rousing speech and a great story about a bunch of people in a cave whose only light source was a single fire sputtering in the middle of it. They had never seen the sun or the outside world until one day, one of them wandered off and discovered both of them. Racing back to his friends in the cave, he told them all about the magical stuff, about the giant blazing eye in the sky, etc. And 
Then all of his friends came up to the surface with him and were super happy. Wow, look at this. Look at this truth we never knew. Look at this. This is amazing. That is the story Magnus told. The real story, and Magnus was fully aware of this, was that his friends looked at him like a crazy person and then decided to beat him to death with rocks because clearly he was a crazy person. The story is supposed to be a warning story about sharing fundamental truths with those who have no interest in hearing them. It's kind of like telling a feminist that there's no gender pay gap. All you're gonna get is claw marks. So Magnus then had chosen to lie. I quite like this because again, it shows us how Magnus's mind functions. He considers that, you know, glossing over a bit of the truth is, is not an issue, it's not a problem. He can simply gloss over this because at the end of the day, the truth that he is striving towards is worth lying for. He has established his greater good. And if you have something like that, the no amount of sacrifice, no amount of lies, no amount of deceit, there is simply no price that is too expensive to pay. And this is really what I think the author is trying to tell us with this. Magnus has become a fanatic. He is now so utterly convinced of his own righteousness that nothing anybody can say at this point can really convince him. He spends quite a while before this lambasting his accusers for their bigotry, for their narrow-mindedness, etc, etc, and to be fair, a fair few of them probably are. Let's just say that when Mortarion was giving his testimony, he also had been somewhat selective with the truth. But the fact remains that it would appear, regardless of what actually happened at this conclave, regardless of what was told to Magnus, he would not change his point of view. He is too set in this, and no criticism, no matter how valid, is likely to shift him. Interestingly enough, I actually think that this testimony did more to condemn Magnus than any of his accusers did, because I suspect that Big E, being Big Fucking E himself, knew about this very story, and was painfully aware of what Magnus had just did, which... See, I really like this story, I really do. It, it paints such a vivid picture of Magnus's motivation, but at the same time, I'm thinking like, okay, Magnus, you're a stupidly smart Primarch that has a closer link to the Emperor with any other Primarch, and you really fucking think that he's gonna buy this? <laughs> I, I <laughs> Fuck me. It really doesn't seem like much of a chess move, does it? But before we get to the final judgment, we have one very interesting little sidestep first. So, Ahriman has been given a highly involuntary look into Magnus' psyche and his deep, dark secrets. And when Magnus is trying to calm him down, he says that even I was ignorant at one point. I knew nothing of the Great Ocean until my father told me of it. And Ahriman says, that's bullshit, you knew of it already. Oh, slightly less combative, but basically that's what he said. Magnus, <laughs> realizing that the gig is up, um, thinks briefly of ripping Ahriman's fucking head from his shoulders, but he's not quite that far gone yet. Now, this is interesting. Magnus already knew about the warp, to some extent. Probably on a, uh, shall we say, instinctual level. He probably didn't, you know, no, no. How do I put it? You know that water is wet. But when you're a child, even though you know water is wet, you don't know why water is wet. You don't understand the structure of water, why we can pass our fingers through it, why some creatures can even walk on it, etc. You know what it is, but you don't really know anything about it, if that makes sense. This might be one of the reasons why Magnus was so quick to see the patterns in the Shattered Eagle statue, which is an interesting suggestion. This speaks of one hell of a long-term plan on the behalf of the Chaos Gods, doesn't it? 
Not only have they created Magnus to be corrupted, given him the tools of corruption, but they've even let him willingly and knowingly walk straight into it without any form of coercion, which is uh, one hell of a deed. Now, he also talks about the corruption in their gene seed. He states that he was too advanced, and he struggles a bit for words until he eventually says that it was the future before collapsing and having various visions which show him all manners of interesting stuff. He sees the past and the future. He sees the forging of the anathema, and he sees Horus fighting his way towards the crashed starship on the moon of Davin, and he understands that that is a very bad thing. Hell, Chaos basically tells him what Horus is planning to do, and mocks him, stating that it's too late now, there's nothing he can do about it. This eventually will bait Magnus into sending his projection, his mind, to try and help Horus, as we saw in a previous book. And this appeal by Magnus was one of the things that made Horus doubt the Emperor, clearly. The Emperor wasn't as perfect, as infallible, as he wanted everybody to think, as here was Magnus, in clear violation of his decree. You know, as much as I've kind of been annoyed at how apparently dense Magnus has been through all of this, I do love this storyline, the complexity of it, how they have a Primarch basically dancing so merrily to their tune, is really pretty goddamn awesome. Now, one final mention, Armin saw Magnus making a pact with an ancient entity, and he mentioned specifically that it's a nasty one, a naughty entity. And since this was, of course, Magnus's memories, Magnus has apparently knew that he was making a deal with the proverbial devil. Ahriman also received many memories of Magnus rationalizing his decision and justifying it, which is quite, um, quite interesting. Magnus knew he was doing something very bad here, which kind of takes away the innocent defense, doesn't it? He didn't simply just blunder across this entity and thinking that it wasn't quite as bad as it might look, made a deal with it. Oh no, he knew what he was getting into, and yet he did it regardless. Now then, let's talk about the verdict. Despite a final defense for Magnus, made by various librarians and chief librarians from the Dark Angels, Salamanders, Ultramarines, White Scars, and Night Lords, interestingly enough. Now, I say surprisingly, but bear in mind, the Night Lords weren't always kill crazy maniacs, or, well, you know, they always had a penchant for torture, don't get me wrong, but. There used to be a noble legion that thought that what they were doing was for the greater good. In fact, they used to hate the act of torture, but they realized that if they could scare the living bejesus out of everyone on this planet, and then show the vid recordings to the next five planets, onto her, all of those would go, please, oh please, oh please, kind gentle overlords, let us surrender. And so it would spare a hell of a lot more suffering than they'd originally created. So, obviously, the odds are that this Night Lord was probably one of the good guys. But despite this final impassioned plea, the Emperor had decided to condemn Magnus in the strictest possible terms. Or, well, to be precise, he didn't condemn anyone or censor, technically speaking, anyone. He simply demanded that all of the legions were to cease all psychic practices henceforth and forever, disbanding their librarius and banning every single Astarte Psyker from ever using their powers ever again, on pains of excommunication and death. That is around about as strict a ruling as you could possibly have made, and I gotta say, I think it's partially due to Magnus's story at the end there. The Emperor must have known about his origins, especially as it came from ancient Terra, a place that the Emperor was very, very familiar with. And the reason why I think this is the reason why he gives down this ruling talking about the dangers of power, how it is very dangerous to seek power for power's sake rather than power for wisdom's sake. 
and how it requires a very unique individual indeed to take that kind of power and not let it rule him. He even psychically talks to Magnus for a short while, which Magnus again demonstrates his ignorance of the point the Emperor is trying to make. I think this was the Emperor giving Magnus one last chance, and Magnus simply says, if I am guilty of anything, it is my pursuit of knowledge. He doesn't even understand what he's done wrong. The Emperor knows he's done a lot of wrong, in all due likelihood he probably suspects that the way he fixed the Emperor's children was less than straightforward as well. And with, again, him trying to pull a fast one on Biggie with that story, hmm. I suspect that despite Magnus' defense, despite the defense of his Librarius, despite the evident case that the Librarius's were good and useful, he condemned Magnus because the fact that Magnus seemed to be incapable of learning the lesson. Although even then, I've got to say, this is a move of supreme hubris on behalf of the Emperor. After all, he is fighting the Chaos Gods here, and he is willingly disarming himself of one of his most potent weapons. The Emperor's decision here is... well both utterly baffling, in that he is robbing himself of one of his most effective weapons against his arch enemies, and also completely understandable, presuming, of course, that he's seen through Magnus. Now, a less extreme thing would perhaps be to censor only Magnus and forbid his thousand sons from continuing to use their librarius, but I don't think it would have done anything. Magnus would undoubtedly have seen that as his father being pressured by the bigots, his detractors, and clearly as being unfair. Hell, it would probably have undermined Magnus's faith in the Emperor quite significantly. That probably would have undermined several other Primarchs' faith in the Emperor as well. And so that wasn't really an option. Honestly, the only reasonable option I can see would be for the Emperor to simply ignore this schism for a while longer. I mean, what possible risk could there be to the Empire from simply ignoring Magnus for a few more decades until he's fully established control over the webway? What possible need does he have to chastise Magnus right now of all times? I mean, after all, if he manages to get the webway up and running, he could offer that to Magnus as an olive branch. He could say, yes, I am going to forbid you from your further studies, but in return, I am going to allow you to utilize your psychic powers to their full potential. I will make you and your legion a cornerstone in the new Imperium. Now, of course, perhaps that wouldn't have worked either, but... It seems a safer bet than this conclave. All in all, I, I wish there was a little bit more build-up for this. We will be getting a little bit more information in the first Space Wolf book, but even then, the foundation for all of this is rather shaky. This really could have used a little bit more building up, I think. It was a damn good chapter, it had some serious twists and turns and some real drama and some really nice little information tidbits, but just a tiny little bit extra on top, just a little bit more spice, and this one would have been absolutely perfect. And with that, I'll wrap up part three. Good god. I always knew the Thousand Sons would be a fat little bastard to do like this, but uh, four parts, holy hell. Well, at least those amongst you who enjoy really, really lengthy videos will uh, really be loving this one. Until next time, I have been Arch, thank you very much for listening, and I hope to see you all again soon. Have a good day.